like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 1, and also if you have a bulletin inside, you'll find some notes. We're going to kind of do a review and pick up where we left off last week. That it's, it is such a large and dire issue. Didn't want to just leave it there. Ephesians 1 beginning in verse 19, says, And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of the might of his strength, which he worked in Christ, by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. Cause us to know this power that you are working within us to the praise of the glory of your grace which you've freely given to us in Christ. Cause us to labor, knowing by faith that we have this power, having seen it in the life of your Son, having seen it in our own lives, having seen it in the lives of others around us, having seen it even by ministering your Word and seeing your people rise from death to life. We know that your word, your gospel, your son, is your power unto salvation. And we ask for that today. We know that there are some souls in here that are outside of Christ, that do not know you in that intimate, salvific way. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would move among us to rescue them, to save them for the glory of Christ and to build us up who have been saved that we may grow in maturity into the fullness that belongs to Christ and that we would have wisdom and discernment and it would all be motivated by love. Help us toward that end, we pray in Christ. Amen. You'll notice the message today is titled, The Church at Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is a place in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. If you've never read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, I encourage you to read it. Don't get an abridged version. If you have to get one with some updated language, do that, but don't get it to where it's shrunken down. You'll want to see that, and if you see, you want to get one of the ones that has the scripture references, tells you where he's getting these ideas from and where he's pulling from. If this is what happens, I'll give you a little snapshot. A man named Christian lives in the city of destruction, and he realizes that he has this burden on his back that he can't get rid of, and that he needs to flee from the wrath to come because the city is going to be destroyed. And so he sets out on his way, skipping over a bunch. But he ends up meeting with a man named Faithful. And Faithful was from his town. And so they were sharing war stories, as it were, of the temptations and the trials and the blessings that they'd received on their journey. And then they meet with Evangelist, and he lets them know that they're going to have to go through Vanity Fair. There's no other way to get to the celestial city than through Vanity Fair. That it was set up knowing this by Satan. But he says, Beelzebub, Apollyon, and Legion. And they set this town up. An evangelist says, at least one of you will seal your testimony with his own blood. They walk into the town and automatically they're realizing this place is very worldly and very different. 
everybody is trying to get them to buy something, but they have no appetite for these things. And everybody's noticing they're dressed different, they talk different, and they're not carrying a bunch of stuff with them. Everybody's trying to get them to buy their stuff. Land, trinkets, even the pastor wants them to come to church and asks what kind of Jesus they want so that he can give them that kind of Jesus. And they say, no, we are here passing through. We want to buy truth. And it ends up that they are arrested for their wickedness, for their blasphemy. And faithful gives an amazing defense, not shrinking back at all. And he seals his testimony with his blood. But it is on account of this that someone in Vanity Fair named Hopeful ends up being saved through their testimony. And Christian and Hopeful continue the journey. But our focus today is that place, Vanity Fair. Because this is where we live. We live in Vanity Fair. It's part of the passing through that we have to do. But the church, as we looked at last time, has been raped repeatedly, generation after generation. And as we'll see, if we step back and look at God's providential hand throughout history, we can see that it is a very shrewd attack that Satan has made upon the church, especially in America. But before we get there, getting a running start, we remember Ephesians 2, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. That's what we're going to look at again, the course of this world. And you remember, we were dead. We looked at that sermon several weeks ago and did a little bit more of it the following week, the moment you died from Romans 5, 12 to 21, that all of us died in Adam. And he couldn't argue his point any more clearly in Romans 5 that we were dead and all died because all sinned. And we looked at that. Looked at what about those that are young, children even, that die, babies that die? It says all die because all sinned. And we recognize that categories need to be in place because they're not able to make decisions at that age. But nevertheless, they died. How did they die? Because of the transgression of one. Because we have representative headship presented to us in the Bible. Now, you can not like this, say it's not fair, do all kinds of different things, but it doesn't change the fact. I once had someone tell me that they didn't like Christianity, they were going to pursue Buddhism because there's no hell. If you're driving on a road that says, stop, road not finished, and they're building a bridge, but they haven't completed it yet, it doesn't matter how bad you want to get across that bridge. If you go down that road, you will drive off a cliff. The truth isn't going to change because of your feelings. What we all have to do when we come to terms with some of these passages in Scripture that great against our flesh is remember Actually, the fact that this bothers me so much and that I'm fighting against it is a testimony of the rebellion that it's speaking of. It's kind of self-authenticating. I'm doing what it says these people do. And I'm still carrying around this body of death, so it makes sense that I would, in my flesh, want to rebel against it. And then we looked at three types of death. Physical death, separation from the soul, Spiritual death, separation from the life of God. And eternal death, separation from God's goodness. You hear that repeating word? Separation. Death brings separation. Death is separation. He says you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So he's referring to the sphere here. And you, being dead talking about the sphere in which we lived, he says transgressions, trespasses. You notice Brother Phil automatically read trespasses in from his memory from an older translation. It's the same kind of idea. You're putting your foot somewhere you ought not to. It's an active condemnation. 
You did something. It's incurring the wrath of God because we've crossed that line. And then, well, let's describe it. We described it with a bridge last week. Let's describe it a little different. These sins of commission. Have you ever been out to the beach where there's boulders and you're walking? Maybe you're checking out tide pools or something like that. And for whatever reason, you realize you need to move quickly. You've got to grab one of your kids. You realize there's a big wave coming, whatever. Or maybe you're not trying to move quickly. And you step on that one rock and you slip. What you don't do is go, who pushed me? Who pushed me? It was our own weight that caused us to fall. Psalm 73, 18. Surely you set them in slippery places. You caused them to fall to destruction. That is a very interesting verse, isn't it? Asaph is saying, God, and the Holy Spirit is saying, God, you put certain people in slippery places. You cause them to fall to destruction. Now, we have to be very careful here because we can't impugn fault or sin or misdoings to God. We can't flatten theology. A lot of people have a flattened theology. It's like the difference between walking around a town and seeing the architecture and the buildings versus looking at a topographical map. There's a lot that you can see that's going to be accurate from a topographical map. But there's no layers, there's no dimensions, there's no height. The Bible has categories, layers, dimensions, height. So, how do we reconcile this? We're going to go over that in the Doctrine and Doxology class after service. So, we'll let you sit with it for a little bit. The next word is sins. Sins. Now, this isn't that active crossing the line. This is sins of omission. Omitted, leaving out, good things left undone. We think of when Paul is bringing a charge against all of humanity. You read through Romans 1, and after his introduction, when he gets into it, he starts attacking pagans, those that aren't religious Jews. And he's going after them. And you've got to remember, this is a church that had some conflict, Jew-Gentile conflict. The Jews started it after Pentecost. The Gentiles come. They're getting saved, and that's a big deal. To us, we don't understand how big of a deal that is. But how do you have unity and fellowship when you will not even eat with someone? That's the most basic of human fellowship. Most of our events have food involved with them, don't they? Even in church, it's prescribed the Lord's table. How do I have unity with someone I can't eat with? That is the mindset that they've been raised and ingrained with. And now, there's a new administration, the church. And so what ends up happening over time, though, is you can read in Acts, Claudius kicks all the Jews out of Rome. So now it's all just Gentiles. Was all Jews, then a mixture, then all Gentiles. And then, he allowed, and then they're allowed to come back. And so now it's Jew-Gentile again. And so there's a little bit of Hey, you snooze, you lose. We were here. So there's a little bit of conflict. So you, you can get the sense that when he's writing chapter 1, the Jews are kind of just like, I knew it. I knew you guys were just a bunch of sinners. But then he gets into chapter 2, and he says, you Jews have a greater accountability because you've been given more blessings and more light. And then he gets into chapter 3, and he says, the whole world is condemned because no one seeks after God. No one does good. And he sums it up with, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Is he talking about primarily transgression there or sin? Sin. Because it's a falling short. It's a leaving something out undone. 
This is passive condemnation. And he's referring here to our rebellious nature. We do have to remember, because there is a pull in our rebellious hearts to want to blame Adam. As if we would have done something different. But the text says, your transgressions and sins. Not your neighbors, not your spouses, not your kids, not your boss, not your presidents. Each one of us has to own our own sin and its guilt. And when we take these two words and combine them together, it shows the extent and the totality of our culpability before a holy God. Our next section in the notes is your former standards of life. Your former standards of life. And this really begins here in verse 2. When it says, in which, you remember going over that, in Greek, pronouns have gender case number. Most of them do. They have case. All of them have case. All of them have number. Some of the personal pronouns don't have gender. This one does. And it's linking back to the word sins. So the sins in which you formerly walked. Because we're born and we're conceived in sin. Let's just remind ourselves really quick what the Spirit says through the Apostle Paul in Romans 5. Verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law was in, for until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Hmm, that is interesting. There's death, but there's only death where there's a law. And before the law of Moses, there was already a law. People died. And so God is handling things justly and righteously. He's not playing any games, hiding stuff. And, ha, gotcha. God's not like that. And one other category that I think would be helpful for us is the fourfold nature of humanity that we see throughout the Scripture. And it looks like this. In the garden, God made Adam and Eve good. Everything was good. So with respect to the will, our chooser, our heart, they were able to sin or able not to sin. As a result of the fall, the testimony of Scripture is clear that now it's able to sin, not able not to sin. And we can do good things societally on a horizontal level. You can bring a meal to someone and not be a Christian. You can speak a kind word. You can sympathize with someone. But it's not good because it's not done for the glory of Christ. Everything has to find its end, its aim, its goal in the glory of Christ and its motivation in Christ's love for us. Because all our righteous deeds, think about that, the best things we've ever done. He doesn't just say all your deeds. He takes a subcategory out of that, out of our works. Takes the best ones. So if we looked at all of the works that we've ever done, we know that there's some sinful ones in there. He's not, he's not talking about that. He's not including that. He's talking about the cream on the top, the best things we've done, the things we'd be proud of. He says, filthy rags. The righteous deeds are filthy rags. So the second movement is able to sin, not able not to sin. And then something amazing happens when the Spirit of God comes and regenerates our hearts after hearing the gospel. Our will is placed back in its former state. Able to sin, able not to sin. And this is an interesting aspect because when we think about the freedom of the will, we have to make sure that we have the proper guardrails on it. Because we, we often define that in all kinds of crazy different ways. Even God's will is constrained. He cannot sin. He cannot lie. He cannot deny himself. Even his will is restrained. And then there's something that amazing after that is heaven and the eternal state. 
Able not to sin? Not able to sin. Isn't that fascinating? And when we're thinking with respect to the will, a good question would be, if our will is free in the sense that it's untethered from most everyone and in most ways God, how does that, we get, we get less when we get to heaven? Because you can't sin once you're in heaven. It's not even a possibility. It's interesting, isn't it? But these, this fourfold, able to sin, able not to sin, Adam and Eve in the garden. And then, every one of us, as a result of the fall, able to sin, not able not to sin. And then the redeemed in Christ, able to sin, able not to sin, back to the garden status with respect to the will. And then, in glory, not able to sin, able not to sin. Now, this section... You walked in line with the temporal values of the world, the course of this world, as he says. The idea, you recall, behind the word walked is a holistic action, the whole of your life. We saw that we, it's not that we had like some sin, but overall, we're good people, which is how we tend to look at ourselves. If, if you've ever gone out and done evangelism and you've ever done the good person test with someone and you ask, would you consider yourself a good person? Most people say yes. And then you ask them, have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah. How many lies have you told in your life? I don't know, lots of them. What do you call someone that tells lies? A liar. Well, what does that make you? Human. You get things like that because they see that where the logic is going and they want to fight against it. And then they make justification. Well, everybody, yeah, that's the problem. We're not being judged according to the standard of everybody. We're being judged by God who is holy, holy, holy. And then you keep going and you can ask other questions. Have you ever stolen anything irrespective of its value? Have you took a 15-minute break when you were only allotted a 10-minute break? That's stealing time from your employer. What do you call someone who steals? Every once in a while, people go, stealer. You go, no, that's a team in Pittsburgh. Thief. <laughs> Have you ever looked at a person with lust in your heart after them? Have you ever hated someone? Regardless of whether or not you act on those. That's sin. How many people do you have to murder to become a murderer? One. One person to become a murderer under human standards. But yeah, you're right. Zero people if we're judging it based upon the heart. And if we took all of those things and we're just going to be judged by those several things, would it be guilty or not guilty? Heaven or hell? The logic is so clear and some of you are even fighting against it because your conscience has been activated a little bit and it condemns you and you don't like it and you've spent a lot of your life trying to silence your conscience that's called searing your conscience and you still try to justify your goodness you can get by your whole life without Christ but you can't die without him So this is walked, holistic, whole of our lives. It's been characterized by living in sin, as we saw, Isaiah 64, 6. All our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. That means that all we did was sin, nothing good before God. We could do good before humans, but not before God. And then he says, according to. This denotes the standard. And when we take according to and walked and you put them together, we're talking about lifestyle. Or if you're reading some of the older Puritans, conversation. We use conversation for talking. They use conversation for lifestyle. And here's the standard, the course of this world. This temporary age of a sin-filled world, as opposed to the age to come when Christ makes all things new. Temporary, changing, 
popular ethics of a sinful world. And recall, the focus isn't on control, because we do have a will, and we do have a measure of freedom, depending on how you define that, within our will. And we're not forced from the outside to do these things, but we are compelled from within, from our own hearts, to pursue these things. And therein lies our culpability. We wanted to. So the world has this influence, and this influence is sinful and deceitful, and it finds attraction in our heart. That's why you sin. You sin because you want to sin. That's how the will, the heart works. It's a chooser. Every single one of us sins because we want to sin. And if you think about it, if something, a temptation, even something was presented to you that you had no affections for, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an issue, would it? If you had a cat diarrhea muffin presented to you and you're like, hey, this is really good, take a bite, take a bite, that's not something that's going to allure your heart or your taste buds or your mind. It might start to turn your stomach because the affections you have for that would be disgust. It'd be a repellent. But if it was something that you loved and desired, and you weren't satiated already, each one of us would take it because of our affections. And the world gives this influence to push us in the wrong direction. But it can't do anything unless we take those steps to pursue it. Now, you recall we, we looked at a couple verses to help get just a brief framework from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 3, and I want to look at those again. And I said, you, you guys should read this later on today. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that was last Sunday, 6 to 8. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are being abolished. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the wisdom which has been hidden which God predestined before the ages to our glory. So the word mystery isn't like how we use the word mystery. We use the word mystery like Sherlock Holmes, Columbo, whodunit kind of thing. Mystery is something that was hidden that is now being revealed. It was concealed, now it's being revealed. Verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So there's a difference between knowing something and understanding it. You can know the Bible, but not understand it. You can know the truth that we're sinners, and that we're bound for hell, and that Christ is the only mediator between God and man. He is the way, the truth, and the life, but not understand it. And there's levels of understanding, aren't there? Because you don't really know something intimately with understanding unless it causes you to move in action. Some sort of affection. Some sort of thinking. Some sort of walking according to that standard. And then in chapter 3, he says in verse 18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise, he must become foolish so that he may become wise. And we see these, these passages here, and it continues on, and it, and it just seems like a contradiction. And For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, so that they are useless. It's counterintuitive, because he's talking about different categories of wisdom, different categories of foolishness. He's talking about different perspectives. The perspective of the world, and then the perspective of God. And so wisdom, 
from the perspective of the world is foolishness from the perspective of God, and vice versa. This is why it's so helpful that we think through things clearly and not that topographical flattening. Now, we brought up how this huge challenge for us living in 2023 and beyond, that the world's defilement of the visible church and in your notes, you should have a section there. It says the world's defilement of the visible church. And this has been going on for decades and decades and decades and decades. And it's still going on. And it's just ever increasing. And so we're going to, I'm going to give you a little more history. And go over some of the same, some different examples. I'm going to go over some of the same ones with some different passages. Let's look at history. We talked about a famous, well-known evangelist named Billy Graham. And many people have been positively impacted. Some have even come to Christ as a resulting of, of God's kindness. And whenever somebody is saved, salvation must always be celebrated. It is a beautiful and a glorious thing. And we should praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that God can save somebody in weird ways, even when sinful means are used. Oftentimes it's, it's well, look, this, peop, this person's saved. So how can you say what he's doing is bad? Well, if we followed that logic and kept applying it, I got saved in prison. Should I then prescribe for everyone that's not a Christian? You know what would really help you? You should go to prison. Get you saved. Is that what happens to everybody in prison? Is that the means, this is the most important part, by which God prescribes that we act? So the fact that God can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick doesn't mean that we should jettison the commands of Scripture and the means and the methods that he's prescribed for us in his word, does it? So, there was a growth in Billy Graham that started in him young, and it came out later in life. And I want to go back over that short, interview, short aspect of the interview with Robert Schuller of the Crystal Cathedral where Graham was asked later in life by Schuler, quote, tell me what do you think is the future of Christianity? Graham replied and never retracted, I think that everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they are members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out from the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world, or the Buddhist world, or the Christian world, or a non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have. And I think that they are saved, and they're going to be with us in heaven. That is diametrically opposed to what Scripture teaches. And we ask the question, how did he get there from his earlier sermons and other things? It started young in him, and it grew over time. The way he went about his crusades was this. Let's lower the doctrinal bar and keep a focus on unity and keep a focus on numbers. Liberals who deny most of our Bibles. Roman Catholics. We're all united together in visible gospel unity. Where did Billy Graham come up with this philosophy? He's not the first person. So where did he get it? Charles Finney. Charles Finney. This is a very important name. You may already have heard this name. Well, let's look a little bit at Charles Finney. Because the work that that man did is not just still around today. It's prevalent today. Billy Graham writes of Finney, quote, Though his spirit-filled ministry through, excuse me, through his, through his spirit-filled ministry, uncounted thousands came to know Christ in the 19th century. 
resulting in one of the greatest periods of revival in the history of America. Born in 1792, professed Christ in 1821, ordained to ministry just three years later in 1824. Finney believed against the prevailing view of that day and centuries past that revival was brought about by obedience. And whenever there was no revival, it was because the church was being disobedient, and that was God's judgment upon them. Now, if you don't have a whole lot of background in Christianity, that can sound kind of exciting, especially when you see things happening. And you're reading about it in the papers. But as you walk with the Lord over time, that is something that will crush your soul. Because you will constantly be wondering why you're being so disobedient to the Lord because he's not giving revival. This is his quote. For a long time, it was supposed by the church that a revival was a miracle, an interposition of divine power. It is only within a few years that ministers generally have supposed revivals were to be promoted by the use of means. God has overthrown, generally, the theory that revivals are miracles. Prior to Finney, revivals were the work of the Spirit of God, as he willed, working through the preaching of the Word and the people of God. You have Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. You have the Great Awakening here in our country. And then near the end of the century is when began the Second Great Awakening. But Finney began to attack the ministers that brought about this first and second great awakening through his preaching, through his interviews, through his teaching, his discipleship, and his writing. And he came on the scene actually when the second great awakening was ending. He professed Christ in in that time, but it was already starting to decline. And it wasn't just... We have to remember, definitions are extremely important. When we think about revival, that is not a word found in Scripture. And so we we need to be very careful to define that word scripturally if we're going to use it and apply it to the church, or to the work of God. The word is thrown out there often with no definition. It's ambiguous. It's intentionally ambiguous. You think what you want, I think what I want. We can be unified. But it wasn't just primarily there's a person here who sets up a big tent, preaches a message, and a bunch of people get saved. So what we're seeing, or what we saw happen at Asbury would not biblically be considered a revival. Now let's not be topographical in our view. Can people be saved? So we're asking the question, can God strike a straight blow with a crooked stick? And the answer is yes. So then should we copy that or praise that or laud that? Sure, if you want to copy my salvation experience, being arrested, going to prison, getting saved. Let's be consistent and let's promote both of them. Because they both affected in salvation. But we wouldn't do that. Before Finney, most if not all the preaching was what some would call Reformed or Calvinistic. When Finney begins his revivals with his new theology, he changes the landscape of what Christianity is supposed to be in this country. Listen to some quotes from Finney. Finney taught and directed people to, quote, make themselves a new heart. Quote, I called upon any who would give their hearts to God to come forward and take a front seat, the anxious seat. I'll pause here for a second. The mourner's bench, the anxious seat, what what we would do, so if we were going to do church the way he would do it, we would have a certain bench up here, right up in the front. And I would meet with some of you, mostly women, because they're better at this, and say, all right, During these times of the message, I want you to cry out really loudly. 
and I want you to weep. You fall on the ground and say, what must I do to be saved? And you do this. This is where we get lights and theatrics and all of this stuff in our churches today. I want to induce an emotion in you. And I want to bring it about using means. Because revival is not a miracle, nor is regeneration. It's all the work of man. And so I'm going to labor with all my rational abilities, according to the works of man, to bring this about. So that's the anxious seat. I called upon any who would give their hearts to God to come forward and take a front seat, the anxious seat. We insisted on immediate submission. I called upon them to kneel down and then and there commit themselves forever to the Lord. I called on those only to kneel down who were willing to do what God required of them and what I presented to them. I called for those whose minds were made up to come forward, publicly renounce their sins, and give themselves to Christ. So, Finney, this is where we get the sinner's prayer. This is where we get decisionism. This is where we get the altar call. Churches did not do altar calls. That's not what was done. That's not in the Bible. You can't find it anywhere. And some people will fight back and go, well, Peter, when he preached his sermon and he calls everybody to come get baptized, okay, well then, let's call it baptism. Or we have to change baptism. Do you see? All of theology is connected. So if we bring in something foreign or we take something out or we modify something within, there is going to be a chain of events because it's all networked like a spider's web together. This is where we get crusades, tent revivals. All of it was built up. When George Whitfield would go and would be preaching, he wouldn't have people set up tents and big tents and then market the event that's going to happen soon. He would go and he would preach and the people would come and rally around the preaching. It was different. So you can see a lot of the same components, but it's very different. Essentially what Finney's doing is he's recognizing by looking at the First Great Awakening led by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, but it wasn't just them. This was happening in churches all over with faithful pastors. I think it was, it was a large percentage of the population. I was trying to find out that number again because I forget where I was reading in a couple different resources. But when you hear like 50,000 people, 100,000 people, things like that, in our day and age, that, it's a lot of people, but I mean compared to like what, 380 million in America? It's a small percentage. But in New England, we're looking at double-digit percentages of people that are actually getting saved and showing it by their lifestyle, by a changed life. It's not a decision made that day, which is how we often count it now. That also was brought about by Finney. But before, it was, we're looking for new affections, a hunger for Christ and for his word and for his people, and a changed life. For example, when Martin Lloyd-Jones took over his first pastor, and he, went, he was in a poor miner's town, and he was preaching the gospel, and he was preaching the word, and he was shepherding people. And all the other pastors around there were wrapped up in Phineism, whether they knew it or not. And they're like, you can't do that. These people are poor. You need to help their social status first and then bring them the gospel. And he said, I'm just going to trust in this book. And by God's grace, that whole town and its economy were turned around. He had a cellar full of liquor from all the people coming and bringing him their liquor because they were repenting of drunkenness. Everything changed. One soul at a time. The life changed. And it was clear. These people are saved. But it wasn't clear in one day. So listen to Finney on Ephesians 2.3. Ephesians 2.3. He quotes, by nature, children of wrath, even as others. His explanation of this passage. Upon this text, I remark 
that it cannot consistently with natural justice be understood to mean that we are exposed to the wrath of God on account of our nature. It is a monstrous and blasphemous dogma that a holy God is angry with any creature for possessing a nature with which he was sent into being without his knowledge or consent. It's fascinating that when you read Ephesians 2, 3, he says it doesn't mean exactly what it plainly means. And that if that were true, it would be monstrous because we have free will and we didn't consent to that. You see, there's some definitions of free will that aren't biblical. He denied the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. He denied moral inability of man. He denied the sovereignty of God. And in some way, twisted or denied almost every other biblical doctrine that the church has held since its inception. When confronted, Finney attacked and tried to use his influence to dismantle faithful churches and the faithful seminaries producing their pastors, especially Princeton Seminary. It was at that time one, one of the best seminaries for those few short years, and it was producing faithful men. And the faithful men that went to Princeton and were sent out from there to pastor churches are the men that God used to bring about the Second Great Awakening. So Finney sought to prove that his new theology, which was mostly just old heresy, was right by the following arguments. Here's his arguments. Listen to this and try not to throw up. I say that God taught me, and I know it. I know it must have been so, for surely I never had obtained these notions from man. And I have often thought that I could say with perfect truth, as Paul said, that I was not taught the gospel by man, but by the Spirit of Christ himself. I had no doubt then, nor have I ever had, that God led me by his Spirit to take the course I did. I was divinely directed. Men are not converted by a change wrought in their nature by creative power, but by yielding to the truth. It's very much just legalism. Finney used emotionalism and decisionism. That's where we get, have you accepted Christ? Will you make a decision for Christ? All of that, Finney. He used these to move people to make a public profession and then deemed them Christians on the spot. And those numbers were then immediately sent to the newspaper for publishing. Immediately. When pastors would try to explain to him the difference between regeneration and conversion, what God does and what we do in response, the need to see people's lives changed, the need to be taught doctrine, the need to be members at local churches, Finney would reply, God has set his seal to the doctrines that were preached and to the means that were used to carry forward that great work. After I had preached some time and the Lord had everywhere added his blessing, I used to say to ministers whenever they contended with me, show me the fruits of your ministry. And by this he meant, how many people have you saved? And by this he meant, how many people have come forward and made a decision on the spot where I haven't observed their life, shepherded them or anything, I've just given them carte blanche indulgence. This is very much like Rick Warren at the SBC. When he gets up, and he says, sorry guys, I've trained more pastors than all of you. I've baptized this many people. i got this many church members. You guys aren't doing that. The spirit of Finney is the prevailing spirit of the church in America. Visible church, I should say. So, examples. That was history. Examples. Examples of worldliness within the church. And we're going to go over these questions again because they're so prevalent. What difference does it make if I believe in blank doctrine or not? You don't need to know that to be saved. Is that the goal of life? Is that the chief end of man? Get saved? You'll notice there's also a correspondence here between 
what's happened with Finney and this prevailing idea and a lack of understanding and a, because of a lack of teaching of sanctification. Sanctification. What's the point in sanctification? The summum bonum, the greatest good, is walk that aisle. Or, if that's not practical, raise your hand so that you can confess him before men. You see the twisting of Scripture. Is that confessing him before men? No. And we know this one. We've heard it all too well. These topographical views. No one's perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect church. As if that's like a gotcha. There's two options. Perfect and imperfect. And if you strive for maturity in pleasing the Lord, oh, you're a legalist. You think you're perfect? Yeah, because there's, no there's, no perf there's no such thing as a perfect church. And if you find it, don't go there because it won't be perfect anymore. But it's faulty logic, and it's unbiblical. These are scripture-twisting logical fallacies because they present only two options. It's called false dichotomy. Where did you go on Sunday? To the gym or to the store? The church. That's not an option. The Bible speaks in terms of degrees, as we recall. Maturity in heart, mind, conduct, transformed by Scripture. Look with me at Romans chapter 12. Start warming up your fingers. Eleven chapters of doctrine on the gospel and its power. Chapter 12, Paul begins to apply it. Therefore, I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. That's interesting. He doesn't say present your hearts. He says present your bodies. So your heart is there, and then it's driving your body. There's actions involved here. There's a lifestyle involved here. Present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And he follows right up with this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. Are you perfect? No, but I'm striving after the perfect will of God by the grace he provides. Look at this, Ephesians 4. <laughs> it's just so fascinating. Even Scripture declares the church isn't going to be perfect in this age, on this earth. And that's not the intention. So the question doesn't even fit within the framework of Scripture. Ephesians 4. Let's begin in verse 11. And he himself, that is Christ, gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. You don't build up things that are perfect. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the full knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, and that sometimes is, off, is, is translated as perfect, the word mature there, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So the standards that are listed here in Scripture about what we should be measuring by is not primarily perfection. There's an aspect of that. For example, when we're examining our life, when we're in prayer, and we're going before God, and we're searching our hearts, the standard then is perfection. We're not to compare ourselves to one another. Because every time we compare ourselves to one another, it's just so strange how we think about our strengths and use those as a comparison. And then we miss the strengths of the other brother or sister, of which we need to see so that we can grow in those areas because they're not our strengths. 
but the perfection is Christ. And that drives our repentance. Well, everybody around me is doing it, so it's okay. Thank you for that, Lord. Um, Lord, I've sinned grievously against you. I thank you for restraining my hands and my actions. But Lord, the ideas and the thoughts that crossed through my mind did not honor and glorify Christ. Please forgive me. Please help me. Train me. The full knowledge of the Son of God. We're to be growing in knowledge. But the point here is we're to be growing. We're not perfect. It's a poor argument. It's a logical fallacy. Yes, there's no perfect Christian. There's no perfect church. Look at Colossians 1.9. We get some other help here too. For this reason, I also, since the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the full knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So it's, it's going after the mind. Why? So that you may walk. So that your life and your conduct and your lifestyle will be what? In a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God. Do you hear that language? Fruitful. Multiply. Does that sound familiar? What's that sound like? Genesis 1. At creation. Well, guess what? You are a new creation. Be fruitful. And multiply. Make disciples. Make disciples, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. Here's another one that we hear often. If you were here last week, you remember this. Doctrine divides and Christ calls for unity among his people. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Does doctrine divide? Are you, are you going to go sit in at a Mormon service? Are you going to go to a rave on Sunday and count that as church? Why not? Because the doctrines those people hold divide us necessarily. And so when you say doctrine divides and Christ wants unity in his church, and you put those two things together and apply them in the way that they're often applied, it's not only a fallacy, it's wicked. Because it stands Scripture on its head. You're making a wax nose out of the Bible so you can twist it whatever way you want. The unstated premises in this argument are that unity is not based upon truth and that getting people saved is the only doctrine that matters. And by getting people saved, you see how definitions are so important? Getting people saved, we don't really mean preaching them the gospel so that the Holy Spirit will regenerate their heart and they cry out in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it's evidenced by a changed life and a new hunger and new affections and new appetites. No, we're talking about coming down an aisle, praying a written down prayer or a repeat after me prayer and then being given a Bible maybe and saying write this date down in your Bible and whenever the devil tempts you to tell you you're not a Christian, you just say, get away from me. You ask God to let him leave you alone. And what they're doing is, in most cases, searing their conscience, being trained to sear their conscience, because they're not living like Christians. And whenever we are not living like Christians, our conscience should act up in that way. And it should remind us, this isn't what a Christian does. Christians don't do this. In fact, because of the movement of Finney and all the people that picked up his torch, we've developed new classes and new categories of Christians. Ever heard of the carnal Christian? That's where that comes. We've got all these new people that are all Christians, but they live differently than Christians of the past lived, and there's no changed life, and they still go to the bar, and they still do this. 
They still cheat on their wives. They still cheat on their husbands. They still do all that. They look just like the world. But bless God, they're Christians because they made a decision. They walked down an aisle. They raised their hand. And by the way, they tell us they're Christians. So love believes all things. What do we call them? The carnal Christian. Do you realize that those two terms cannot be placed together? That there is no such thing as a carnal Christian? We were carnal according to the flesh. But by God's grace, we're renewed in the spirit of Christ and we're putting to death the deeds of the flesh. We're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect in this life. We're going to sin. We're going to fall. We're going to stumble. But we're not going to stay in that habitual sin, loving that sin. Especially the sins of omission. Leaving things undone. Not praying. Not meditating on the Word. The reason why prayer is one of the most wicked sins is because it's us in rebellion against God. Saying, I don't need you. I am autonomous. I have a free will. I make my own decisions. I don't receive life from your life. You don't control the day I was born or the day I die. I control these things. I can accomplish this on my own without your help. It's that pride. Doctrine divides and Christ calls for unity among his people. Yeah, it does divide. And yes, we will lose relationships with professing believers. We want to make sure that it's not because of our conduct, like we're being jerks, because then that's not the right kind of separation. But turn with me to John 17. So d does that mean then that there will not be unity? How many times have you heard or read online statements about the church is so divided right now and what we need to do is unite and come together? Is the church divided right now? John 17, 17. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, prays to the Father. Sanctify them by the truth. He is interceding for his people. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And here we are. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, if it's true that the church is not united, we've got a bit of a problem. And say, well, Jesus can unite the church throughout time, but not in the present. The Father doesn't answer all the Son's prayers. Some of them. Where, where is that secret decoder glass that you would find to say which ones he does and which ones he doesn't? I would submit to you that the church is united. The true church. Because remember, the word church means assembly, and it's used with two different senses, so it can't be topographical. It's used in the sense of a local church, a local physical assembly, and it's used with a view to the future of the universal church all throughout time. So we would say, with believers in Pakistan or in Iraq right now, that we're united with them. We might have some different views on some doctrine, but we're united with them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, more so than my Republican American neighbor who's not a Christian, but lives a very upright life. 
The true church is united. And there's times when Christians sin against each other, but true Christians are quick to repent and to reconcile. Iodia and Syntyche, I urge you to get in harmony together in the Lord. Why? Because this is, this is Christ's will for us. So there's times we fall out, but we get right back in. But here's the problem. There are demons masquerading as pastors and teachers, and they're filling up these buildings with goats in the name of God, and they slap church on the front. That's the problem. And you already know this. You already know this. How often have you met somebody that professes Christ, and typically one of two things happens? There's a third one. I'll give you all three. You realize this person's not a Christian. They're just saying they're a Christian. The third one is, I'm not sure. But the second one, you realize this person is a Christian, and you have unity and fellowship with a person you just met like you've been lifelong friends. Because you're united in Christ. Because you're part of the true church. Because there really is unity. The problem is, that push for the unity on the level and the way it's being pushed is saying, Sheep, shack up with the goats. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Listen carefully to what he says just in this first verse. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now one thing that's very interesting that we, we tend to forget, is I think we have too much of a dichotomist view. Church world. We need to have more categorical, more subset. Visible church, and then there's categories within that. Because there can be non-believers in the visible church. And they can be long-time upstanding members. When we think about the parable of the soils that Jesus gives us, two of those people will be in the visible church. Have you ever thought through that? The first two, obviously not. One for a little bit. But the third one, it's just unfruitful, but it doesn't go away. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it, and it becomes unfruitful. And so there's this observation of life that we're all to do for one another, spiritual fruit inspecting, if you will, not so that we can condemn people, but so that we can help build up one another. Paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Have you ever thought about how scary that is? Demons teach. They teach outside the church. They teach in the church. But demons teach. Look at Matthew 10. Doctrine divides. Jesus says, Matthew 10, let's start in 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses, he's just given them an encouragement not to fear. If you're going to fear anyone, verse 28, fear God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Birds don't even fall to the ground apart from God. The hairs on your head are numbered. Do not fear, you're valuable than many sparrows. 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to divide and to separate. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. 
the closest unit, the most intimate unit, division will happen, not just in some areas on the outskirts, it's not division on the fringes, it's division in the most intimate of units, a unit that God created. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Look at 2 John, all the way near the end of your Bible. You could easily pass over it. It's on page 1639 in the LSB. And that's it. No other pages. Verse 5. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. That was a big one during that time. It was proto-Gnosticism. There's more information you need. There's greater revelation. Like um, the Enneagram movement would be something similar to that in our day. Yeah, the Bible's the authority, but you need something else. And we have that for you. It doesn't supplant the Bible. It's just a useful tool, critical race theory, things like that. You need more knowledge. There's something more that you need outside of the Bible. God hasn't really given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. Good thing I'm here to help you. That's a deceitful spirit. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. See to it. See to yourselves that you do not lose what we accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. So this isn't just like if you're talking with Mormon missionaries that you're not going to, on a rainy day, sit down around your table and have a conversation. This means you're not going to aid them. You're not going to, because what you have is itinerant preachers, people moving around, preaching the gospel, seeking to plant churches, and there was other people that would show hospitality. You don't show hospitality to someone that doesn't have the right doctrine. Why not? Which, think about that conversation just for a second. What's that conversation going to be like? What are our conversations like with professing Christians? It's like, well, I don't want to step on their toes and say, well, what's the gospel? How did you come to know Christ? How has he changed your life since then? Now, those are the questions we should be asking. That's why if you're part of the welcoming ministry, when we have visitors and guests, that's something that we should be asking people, right? That's on that sheet. Some people have been offended by it. And that's okay. If you're a Christian, and somebody gives you the opportunity to talk about Christ, are you going to be offended by that? Isn't that kind of like what we long for? Like when I go out and do evangelism, nobody comes to me and says, hey, tell me the gospel. Tell me about Jesus. We're proclaiming him. But for somebody to come up and say, tell me, tell me the reason for the hope within you. This is awesome. This is a good day. I like this church already. Verse 11, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. When we partner with the world by accepting any part of its influence to accomplish any goal, we participate in the rape of the bride of Christ. 
Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Paul says, absolutely not. This is why the church is so worldly. We saw in 1 Timothy 3, 15, 14, that the church is the household of God, the pillar and support of the truth. And if you think this is relegated to a religious conversation, all you have to do is take a state of our country. Look at the state of our country. Do you know why it is the way it is now? Not because of politicians, primarily. There's causes in there, and they're culpable, but because of pastors. Because of churches. Because if the church is the pillar and support of the truth, as Scripture says it is, and they're not proclaiming the message of the truth and holding fast the truth, calling sin, sin, calling people to Christ, the moral decay will spread out from there. Especially if they're just, because they're not being silent, are they? It's not like they're not saying anything. But they're teaching these churches and these pastors different doctrines. Which is worse, it'd be better if they didn't say anything. But we see this happen all throughout societies. The reason you have good, healthy societies, like the United States of America was, not perfect by any means, a lot of sin and a lot of work to go, because we're all fallen human, but the trajectory, and when you see true revivals happen, you see lifestyles change. And then when you see lifestyles change, you see towns change. And then when you see towns change, you see surrounding towns and cities change because people are getting saved. And it's not, I have to have all these laws to keep me moral with a threat of judgment and punishment. It's out of the overflow of my heart and my love for Christ. I want to do these things. I need no law. I have the law of Christ in my heart. Culture and societies change. So we have to be vigilant to put to death these areas in our lives individually where we follow the course of the world in the religious and the secular sense because it's all the wide path. They're all united in that. That's why they want our unity too. And there's the sins that we grew up with. We talked about this just briefly in passing. Cultural sins, sins you grew up with. And if you're a parent, you've probably done this. You're in a situation with your first kid or the first, situa first situation you, you've been in with your second kid because your first kid didn't do this. And your response to it is almost identical to what happened when you were a kid. And that's how you handle that. What you don't do is pause, pray, and investigate the scriptures to see what is my response supposed to be in this situation. I'll give you an example. When Crystal and I find, found out we were pregnant, I was so excited. First thing I wanted to do I was, that I was thinking about, because her due date was in November, end of November, and I was like, cool, she's going to be here for Christmas. I can't wait to do Santa Claus with my kids. That was so much fun growing up. And then I was thinking through that, and I was like, well, wait a second. Lying is a sin. And if I'm going to be teaching and training and disciplining my kids against lying, I'm going to be a hypocrite if I do it the way that we did it when I was young, growing up. Whoa, hold on. What else do I need to think through? And part of it was like, man, this is a bummer. Those were so fun. And I had to remind myself that God gives us commands for our good, Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. And it's only a bummer because I'm thinking according to the flesh. And still, I'm going through these things in my life as God brings them up. Wow, okay, this isn't the right way to handle this. I have no biblical warrant for this whatsoever. Cultural sins. They're especially dangerous because we often don't see them due to our blindness. And I liked this illustration from last week, so I'm going to use it again. They're like carbon monoxide to the soul. They're like carbon monoxide to the soul. They cause weakness, blurred vision, severe impairment, confusion, and they suffocate biblical love. But I want to go a little further. What is the, what, 
who is the primary target, do you think, with respect to cultural sins? I would submit to you it is Christians and our children. Christians and our children. And we all do this. Well, they say, you need this much sleep. They say, kids at this age need to be doing this. They say, who are they? And it's authoritative over Scripture at times. I'll give you an example. Well, children need to be surrounded, they say, by others their own age for their social skills and for this and for that. Right? Where does this come from? Well, on our way to that destination, let's take a quick detour. Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with the wise will be wise, but the friend of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs 18, 24. A man of too many friends comes to a ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 1, 19, 63. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Why would he say that? Because we're gullible in this area to be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become righteously sober-minded and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Children need to be surrounded by others their own age, they say. And we eat it up, like, oh, cool, this is helpful. And the Bible says, the group that you put them in, you're training them to conform to the standards of that group. I read a couple journal articles by psychiatrists and psychologists and sociologists on this, and they all recognize that as humans, we're moldable by our parents and our friends and all these things, especially when we're young. And so the thrust of it was, so parents, make sure you're setting a good example. Which isn't a bad thing, but it neglects the aspect of bringing them around people your own age. Where does this come from? Why do Christians buy into it? Two places. The world and a denial of the sufficiency of Scripture. It comes from the world and then we choose to follow it when we deny the sufficiency of Scripture. This is why public schools are so dangerous. It's part of the agenda. And I know some of you aren't going to like that I say that, but do you know why we have public schools the way that we have them now? They are a result of the Industrial Revolution to train people to have basic capabilities so they can operate the machinery so that they can be workers for the economy of the country. That's why. I'm not telling you what to do or what not to do other than this is what the Bible says. You have a responsibility to shepherd your children. And when you bring them into these environments and put them in environments where there's a whole host of non-believers with their non-believing kids and you're putting your child in with their children, you can't send your kids to Caesar every single day or once a week or whatever it might be and then be shocked when you find out you have a Roman for a child. That's the goal. That's the goal. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. We have a responsibility to protect our kids. But look at this with me. Romans 16. Romans 16 17 and 18. How many other areas of our lives do you think we're just buying into stuff and not even thinking about it? 
There's a podcast recently with the biblical counselors, ACBC, talking about how we use all these different ages to break up our kids for what they need. And not just for what they need physically, but for what they need emotionally, mentally, things like that. The word teenagers isn't in the Bible. How do we categorize people and their age? Look at what the Bible says and how the Bible categorizes people. It has enough in there to get the point across. Can there be benefits of saying, well, this age and this physically? Yeah, but that's part of natural revelation. And the aim is different there. So let's not do a false dichotomy, topographical view, and get all upset. But when we're dealing with the soul, the heart, the mind, do we really believe Scripture is sufficient? Or are we going to follow after that Gnostic way? I need something more. I need something extra. This is what Paul says. 16, 17. I urge you, brothers, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and stumblings contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. He's not just talking about those within the church. It's everyone. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own stomach. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. 2 John 2. Second John 2.9. You remember we went over this. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. How much more do we do that with all these cultural ideas and philosophies that are the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, that we just eat up because it sounds good, or because it's pragmatic. Relativism, pragmatism. Well, that works for your family, and that's all fine and great, but you don't understand the things I've got going on in my family, so that's not going to work for us. What works for us is this. Relativism and pragmatism. Truth is relative. We're going to do what works. Relativism, truth is relative. We're going to do what works. How about restructuring your life to make sure that it's in line with Scripture? If that's what has to happen, that's what has to happen. And it should be a joy, even through the difficulty, because it's for the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 6, 11. Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. Now in a like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. Now this passage is not primarily about marriage. It applies there, but it's not primarily about that. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? This is even with philosophies, ideologies, anything like that. We're going to take a pagan concept and bring it into our home and use it as a governing principle. We're partnering. When we do that, we're partnering. It gets worse. Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Are Christ and Satan unified? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has a sanctuary of God with idols? For we are the sanctuary of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
Philippians 3. I think it's helpful for us to remind ourselves, what does an enemy of the cross of Christ look like? What does an enemy of the cross of Christ look like? And you may be thinking, Joel Osteen, people like that. TBN, if they're on TBN, chances are they're an enemy of the cross of Christ. And that's true, but we're not doing topographical, right? What does the Bible say? Philippians 3.17 Brothers, join in following my example and look for those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even crying, as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's going to describe them. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their stomach, their appetites, and glory is in their shame, who set their thoughts on earthly things. When that first hit me, enemies of the cross of Christ is like somewhere over here. And when that hit me, enemies of the cross of Christ is actually, the bar's really low. James 4. We have a sufficient word. We could go all night. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So there's the affections running rampant, prayerlessness. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. When you take those wrong affections and then you do mix it with prayer, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. He says adulteresses, feminine, because he has in mind, we are the bride of Christ, and you are committing adultery against Christ by aligning yourself with the world. 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, not being conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your conduct. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your sojourn, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your feudal conduct. He doesn't have justification in mind in this verse. He has sanctification in mind in this verse because the aim, to, the aim is our walk. From your feudal conduct inherited from your forefathers, but you were redeemed with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So what are we to do? We are to discipline ourselves. You'll see the next section says, discipline yourself. And we've already looked at 1 Timothy 4, but I'll read some of it. Verse 6, in pointing out these things to the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but refuse godless myths fit only for old women. He's saying that tongue-in-cheek part. On the other hand, train yourself. So the refuse is a command, the train yourself is a command. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily training is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Here's a good test. How much time do you spend in bodily discipline, exercise or whatever, versus how much you spend in training yourself for the purpose of godliness? Are you putting more effort, more attention, more of your heart, more of your resources in things of the world that will perish? Or are you storing up your treasures in heaven that's something interesting to think about. Now listen. Discipline yourselves. We all fail in that, don't we? We procrastinate. 
we don't follow through. And I'm sure you can relate to this. How many regrets have you had in your life for a lack of discipline? And then the time passes and it's complete and you didn't do it. Or you didn't do it the way you ought to have done it. And you mourn. And sometimes that might even lead to depression. But one thing you don't do is you don't step out in faith in Christ's word and discipline yourself for the sake of godliness. You'll fall into self-pity. Now I can tell you this with 100% certainty. Especially if you're just trying to labor on a most basic level. Your affections are showing you where your heart's at. And you can't do this in your own strength. You have to do this in the strength that Christ provides. Which is why prayer is crucial. And I can tell you with 100% certainty that unless you labor now to glorify Christ by disciplining your body, your flesh, by disciplining your mind, your heart, according to Scripture, that just as you've had many bouts of depression in the past for your lack of discipline, you will be weeping in hell. Because you always had one more time. You always had one other time. I can, oh, I'm going to get it next time. I'm going to get it next time. I'm going to get it next time. But you didn't. And there comes an end to all things. And you will be one of those weeping. Probably won't be gnashing your teeth. You'll be weeping. Because you knew what the right thing to do was, but you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't. You've always had another chance, and so you think you're going to have one more. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appropriate time. This moment this moment, consider Christ with me. Galatians 4, so also we, while we were children, were enslaved under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, when the time was ripe, what did Christ do? What did the Father do? Did they delay it? No. God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And and what was he What was he doing? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though being rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Think about that. Think about leaving those riches. Psalm 16, 11. In your presence is fullness of joy, in your right hand are pleasures forever. This is what he's stepping out of still. He stepped off his throne to take on flesh. And he did so out of love for his Father and love for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he's calling now through me, through his word, through your conscience, through creation. Come. Come. Come to me. Why? Why is he doing this? Well, in our passage in Ephesians, if we were to jump ahead a little bit to verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up and seated us with Christ. Unbeliever, do you want Christ? Do you want him? Run to him. Run to Christ. But I'm dead in my sin. I can't. Your inability is a moral inability, not a natural inability. It's a moral inability. You don't have the ability because you don't want to. Because you're enslaved to your lusts and your desires. But if you want to, run to Christ That is God's mercy and His kindness and His grace upon you. He is calling you. He's calling you now. Fly to Him. Leave nothing behind of your sin and leave everything behind of your actions of sin. Take all of your sin and all of its guilt and lay it upon Christ. Embrace his nail-pierced hands and cast everything on him. And believer, look upon this same Christ that saved you in the same fashion 
that has sustained you through every trial, that has grown you to be more like him moment after moment. And you can remember, you can remember, looking back, some of the sins you would perform as a young Christian and not give two thoughts about it, how wicked they were. And now you're struggling over your sin, most of which is taking control of your heart and your mind with minimal actions of sin outward. He's growing you. The reason you feel worse now is because you're growing in holiness. He's loved you with an everlasting love. Why were we raised from death to life? It says because he loved us and still loves us. Finally, the remedy. The only way to combat the rampant worldliness in the church and our hearts is love. Just as God loves us to combat the sin that we have. Just as the love of Christ controls me, constrains me. It's always been love. We must see the love of God towards us and rest in it. Rejoice in it. Remember it. Labor from it. We have to labor individually and corporately to know him. That passage we read from Ephesians 4 about the building up of the body of Christ together. How does he, how does he end that? Verse 14, so that we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Oh, well, this person said this. Well, that person said that. Well, this person said this. Well, I don't know which one to choose. You have a Bible. You have a Bible. And until you understand this book, don't be running around testing spirits. You're going to make shipwreck of your faith. What are you going to compare it to? You have no anchor. What's the standard going to be? You don't know. How do you know if they're using the verse out of context? You don't. And so what's the standard? Your affections. Your affections. So you will not be building your life on Scripture. You'll be building your life on your already affections. And if you are a new believer, you know you've got a lot of sin. There's a lot of flesh that has to be put to death. Do you think they affect your affections? Every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ from whom the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies, here's that corporate aspect now, according to the properly measured working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And as we run this race, sometimes we stumble and we have to look down, but we need to keep our eyes on the prize and we need to remember that others have run this race before us and they've won. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Regarding the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking for the reward. Let's pray. Father, we have failed in executing so many of these duties and responsibilities that we have, and, and we have brought shame upon ourselves and upon those that have been close to us, upon our children. Grant us repentance. Let us, let us come to you, even now corporately, but also individually. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us and wash us, we pray, according to your word, according to your promise that we may be forgiven, that we may be cleansed and renew in us, renew in us the fullness of that new heart that you've given to us. Work within us so that we might constantly be transformed by your word, by the love of your son. Grow us. Cause us to remember that all we have is Christ and that we are strangers passing through. We are here for a purpose to grow in holiness, to make disciples as we seek to glorify and enjoy you in preparation for that heavenly life. Cause us to be faithful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.